Now, some of you may be able to cast your minds all the way back to 1982. Who was around in 1982? Yeah? Awesome. Everybody was around in 1982. Well, there was a song that hit the top 10. In fact, it hit the number one spot for quite some time in 1982. And uh, it was by a guy called Joe Cocker and Jennifer Warnes. Do you remember those two? Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, everybody says. And the song was Love Lifts Us Up Where We Belong. Yeah, do you remember that one? Yes. Love lifts us up where we belong. Oh yeah, Esther knows that one. She's jigging away at the back. All right. Now I'm not gonna I'm not gonna uh, torture you anymore. Okay, by singing the rest of it. But love lifts us up where we belong. And although the words were written for a secular song, uh, and they were, uh, they tell us of a truth that we all recognise. And if we think about just those, just the title of the song, Love Lifts Us Up Where We Belong, if we look at that from a, just a Christian perspective, I think that we can all certainly affirm that love lifts us up to the place where we belong in Christ. Because God is love, isn't he? We know that. We, we, the word tells us that God doesn't just love us, he is love. God is love. And God so loved the world that he gave his only son. So it was because he's love and he loved us, he sent his son into the world. And through that, through being in Christ, he has lifted us up and we're seated with Christ in heavenly places. So in, in, in a very literal spiritual sense, spiritually literal, <laughs> Love has lifted us up to where we belong. Now, when children grow up in a family that is loving, they grow up emotionally well balanced and they become resilient. They're resilient to the things that life throws at them. There's been lots and lots of studies done uh, in child psychology that, that demonstrate this. Uh, so they grow up emotionally well-balanced, resilient to the things that come against them in life. And they enjoy relationships with other people because love conditions them to, to be free in the exchanges and safe in the exchanges between each other in their relationships within their family. But that also then flows out to their friendships and flows out to others around them as well. So love is a really important thing that, that as people we, we know begins to transform us. And kids, when they grow up in a family which is loving and they have that loving environment, those kids tend, as they get older into adult life, flourish. They flourish in life because they've got a really great secure standing in that place of security and love that came to them from their parents and through that family. But we all know that, of course, that isn't always what we necessarily experience. Some of us have experienced quite the opposite. Some of us have experienced maybe it wasn't, you know, love meant something different in your environment, in your family. Some didn't even grow up in families. And so they missed out on, on that kind of love, that unconditional love that parents give. So we know and we understand that although that is the ideal, although that is, the, that is what God designed for us as parents to nurture our kids in love, that always wasn't our experience. If you want to see love lift up, there's three things that we need to remember. The three things that we need to do. We need to see, we need to love, and we need to lift. If we want to see love lift up. Now, love is a very, very powerful, transformative force. And when we live in that environment, then we see things grow, we see things becoming healthy, and we see people begin to flourish. So the first thing that we need to do if we want to 
see love lift is to change the way that we see how many of you know that seeing is more than simply looking okay I'm, I'm looking I'm looking I can see all sorts of things in front of me but there's more to seeing than simply looking when we see we also perceive we can see truth we can see all sorts of different things there's more to seeing than simply just looking in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 16 so from now on we regard no one from a human point of view according to worldly standards and values though we have known Christ from a human point of view we no longer know him in this way now point of view is a perspective right how many people did technical drawing when they were at school? Yeah. All right. Did you ever do single point perspective? Yeah. Three point perspective? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, you know, perspective is from a particular vantage point. And that vantage point is always the vantage point of the viewer. So if you were doing a, a sort of a painting or a drawing, a drafting of a room or whatever, you would do it from a single point of perspective, from the vantage point of the viewer. And everything else gets drawn according to that so that's what a perspective is now let me give you an illustration the question David is uh, what is on the front of that coin can you see it well Michael might be able to help you is that the Queen Michael is that the Queen's head well if I was to tell you no it isn't the Queen's head it's actually a picture of a platypus and you can't quite see that but anyway well, I was close you were close <laughs> all right now it's a simple illustration but the point is this from your perspective you saw the Queen's head right but from my perspective from my side of the coin it was a platypus because this is an Australian coin so uh, anyway thanks David for participating I'll put it in the post to you that's your reward so perspective is always seen from the vantage point of the viewer and we don't always see what other people see Paul once said that he regarded Jesus from a worldly or a human point of view so in his opinion Jesus you see was just an ordinary man that's what he believed so when he saw and he was listening to what the disciples were saying about Jesus he just saw Jesus just as a regular guy you know maybe he was a special kind of guy and he certainly got a lot of followers but as far as he was concerned Jesus was just an ordinary ordinary Joe and it was because of his perspective on Jesus that he was just an ordinary guy that is why he persecuted the church because Jesus made certain claims and those claims were that he was the Son of God which made him equal to God and that as far as he was concerned was utter blasphemy because the good upstanding religious citizens of Israel said that can't possibly be and that's why they put Jesus to death that's why Paul got letters from the Sanhedrin to persecute the Christians confiscating their possessions and would drag them into court and sometimes that they would kill them because that was their perspective that's what they saw he was utterly convinced that he was doing God's work from his perspective what changed his perspective because we know of course that he didn't continue doing that what was it that changed his perspective well what changed was the fact that Paul ended up having an encounter with the Living God in Acts 9 verses 3 to 6 Paul it says here as he neared Damascus on his journey suddenly a light from heaven flashed all around and he fell to the ground and he heard a voice say to him Saul Saul why do you persecute me who are you Lord Saul asked I am Jesus whom you are persecuting and he replied now get up and go into the city and you'll be told what you must do 
Paul had a personal encounter with the one that he thought was just a man and he thought that he was already dead. And yet on the road to Damascus, he has an encounter with a dead guy who isn't so dead. Right? So when he has this encounter with the living God, everything about his perception of who Jesus was completely changed. In an instant, his perspective changed. Because before that encounter, Paul was spiritually blind, completely spiritually blind. He was judging things from a worldly perspective. And after this encounter with Jesus, he actually became physically blind, which kind of relates to that spiritual blindness. But when he became physically blind, he began to see spiritually. He saw suddenly who Jesus was and what he'd been doing was wrong. And so his perspective was completely changed. Now I want you to notice particularly the words of Jesus. Listen to this. Jesus said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And then he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Paul was putting the followers of Jesus to death. And yet Jesus doesn't say, why are you persecuting my church? He doesn't say that. He doesn't say, why are you putting your, your brother Jews to death? No, he says, why are you persecuting me? Why are you persecuting me? Last week, I said one of the works of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer was to unite us in Christ Jesus. Okay, there's just something that happens when you give your life to Christ and the Holy Spirit comes and lives on the inside of you, that the Holy Spirit does this work of unifying you in Christ. And we, we talked about being hidden in Christ Jesus. The work of the Holy Spirit unites you in Jesus. So Jesus is so united with us, with you, with me, with those persecuted believers, that he spoke to Paul in first person singular. Not the church, not other people, not others are you persecuting. He said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. Jesus took it very personally. Why? Because you're united with him. Because those believers, the church was so united in Christ through the spirit that Jesus said, you're persecuting me. You're hurting me, Paul. Why? Jesus explained this a little bit further using a metaphor of sheep and goats. You remember the, uh, when Jesus was telling this metaphor about those who were hungry and those who were thirsty and they gave him something to eat and something to drink. And when there was a stranger coming by, uh, they took him in. And then he said those who, were, who had clothing and need of clothing, that you clothed them. And when they were imprisoned, you went and visited them. In Matthew 25, and also in verse 40, he says, the king will reply, I tell you, whatever you did or did not do for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did or did not do for me. How great do you think is the love that Jesus has for the least of these? How great that he says, if you do just something so simple, for one of them, you're doing it to me. It's not you're doing it to them, you're doing it to me. That's how closely Jesus identifies with you and how he identifies with his church. And I want to caution as well, because that's a, that is like a two-sided coin, that parable. 
Because, yeah, there were those who went and visited in prison and clothed and fed, and they did those things, and Jesus said, well done. Those were the sheep. He put on one side, and he says, you did that for me. Even though they didn't know they were doing it, he said, you did it for me. But on the other side of the coin, on the other perspective, he said, when you didn't do it for me, you weren't doing it to me. We need to be aware that and not focus simply on the positive because that's actually a parable which is a two-sided coin. So if we're not to regard others from a human or a worldly point of view, how are we supposed to see them? Well, in Corinthians, Paul tells us in the next verse. In 2 Corinthians 5.17, he says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. That's the perspective. That's the side that we have. When we think about how we need to change the way we see, we need to change the way we see so that we see what Christ sees. See, if you're in Christ, you are, and you have a new perspective, a new perspective on life. You have a new perspective on who you are, and we should have a new perspective on other people too. See, we no longer regard anyone from a human point of view. Instead, we regard them from the perspective of new creation, because we're all new creations in Christ Jesus, every one of us. That is that we need to see the other people as they are in Christ Jesus. That's how we need to see them. In Christ Jesus, we're not to judge them according to our old ways of thinking. Now, we all have old ways of thinking, right? We all do, and we all do this, myself included. We judge people according to worldly standards, according to worldly values, according to things which are acceptable to, to given standards, but that isn't what Jesus is asking of us. He's not asking us to judge according to worldly standards or values. He's saying, I want you to start seeing people, change the way you see, and start seeing people as who they are in me. Who they are in me. When I was in Australia, I was, uh, uh, we, were, we were coming to Canada, we, we, we had a date, we knew it was gonna be roughly a year or so before we would get here. And so I started the process of enculturing myself into Canadian life. And, uh, and so uh, the only way that I could do this was to find, you know, um, programs, right? Canadian programs, so that I could learn how to say A eh properly, all right? And, uh, and so that I could get an understanding for what life might be like for a Canadian's perspective. And one of those things that I found, which is a, 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 a brilliant program, which really helped me and Becky to orient ourselves to Canadian life, was Canada's worst driver. <laughs> right? So we watched the entire series of Canada's worst driver. And, uh, and that was our introduction into Canadian life. And, uh, and one of the things that I always remember, because again, they repeat lots and lots of things over and over again, is one of the things the guy said was, look where you're going. <laughs> All right? So when you're in a skid or whatever, look where you want to go. And why? Because if you look where you want to head, your body just automatically begins to steer towards it. You see, what you see is really important. Because whatever it is that you're looking at is what you tend to steer towards. Now, you know when you're driving, you know when you're trying to do your makeup. Girls. <laughs> when you're trying to do your makeup, right? Or something distracts you, you know, squirrel. And you're looking out the side or your kids are doing something, you know, and you're not paying attention to where you're going. How many of you have drifted across the road in the direction that you're looking? Canada's worst driver. All right, yeah, okay, we, we know this is true. And this is why if we're going to see love lift up other people, 
we need to change the way we see. We need to change the way that we see other people because the way that we see them is the way then that we're going to treat them. It's the way that we're going to behave towards them because that's what we see. So it becomes really important that we be careful how we see and what we see. See, if you see a brother or a sister as a problem, you'll treat them as a problem. And somebody who gets treated as a problem begins to act like a problem, right? It's true. And they begin to conform to the image that you have of them because of the way that you see them. But when your mind is renewed and you see them the way that Jesus sees them, your whole perspective begins to change. It changes. You begin to honor them and love them and treat them with the same respect that you'd show Jesus. Because when you begin to hold up that pattern of Jesus, when you begin to see somebody as they really are in Christ and you've got a strong image of what that looks like, you'll begin to treat them that way and they will begin to live into that image that you have of them. Amen. So, if we're going to see love lift other people up, after changing the way that we see them, we need to love them. In Ephesians 4 and verse 15 and 16, it says, Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. For him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. And we all have a part to play. We've all got a part to play in this because we all need a part to play in building one another up in love because that's what we've been called to do. Jesus said, you know, this is his body, right? He's the head and he says, this is how my body works, right? You know how your body works. You feed it the right foods. You clothe it well. You look after it. Jesus also knows how to look after his body. He also knows how to feed it well and see it grow and strengthen. And this is how he says you do it. Speak the truth in love. Speak the truth in love. That's how it grows up. Our best growth happens in an environment of love. That's just, that's just the way it is. Just as we see kids in, in, a, in an environment of love grow into the best versions of themselves, all right, that they can, so too is the same for us. When we grow in the church in an environment of love, we grow into the best versions of ourselves. But every good vinter knows that you need to prune a vine to maximize fruit. You need to prune it. And so we're called to love one another. But in calling, in that calling to love one another, what does that mean? Does it mean just we just kind of like give each other high fives and, and we just get gooey about it? That's not the kind of love that Jesus is talking about. We need, if we're going to build one another up in love, we also need to be committed to radical truth telling radical truth telling we need to say what we see see if a brother is caught in sin the word says you who are spiritual that is to see them and to see them as a new creation that's what it means to be spiritual spiritual people see others through the lens through the eyes of new creation you who are spiritual Restore them gently. You'll find this in Galatians 1. You who are spiritual, restore them gently, speaking the truth in love. That's what that means. That means when we, 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 we work with people gently 
to restore them in love. But we also have to speak the truth too. Now that's not easy. In fact, that's really, really difficult. <laughs> because the reality is that we've all been conditioned completely differently. It is not natural for us to see as Christ sees. It's not natural for us to see people when we see a discrepancy between what, what, what people are supposed to be in Jesus and what we actually see. It's not easy, I know it's not easy. But if we're to see love lift others up, so they become the full potential of who they could be, and we need to do this. We need to do this and we need to do it well. If we say nothing, and we let the other person continue to hurt themselves and hurt others. Is that telling the truth? Well, no, it's not. That's not telling the truth. But love will bring around gentle correction in those areas. And that's what we need to know. It is so important that we see love and truth together. It isn't one or the other. It isn't one or the other. Otherwise, we end up, if it's all love, we end up with this mushy, sentimental kind of Christianity where anything goes. And if we just have truth, then we're going to end up with a very legalistic church that really nobody wants to be part of. I don't want to be part of that. So it has to be the two together. And that's what Paul asks us to do. Jesus says that if we do, each of us do his part, then we will build one another up in love. Matthew 7, verse 3 to 5. says, Why do you look at a speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, Let me take the speck out of your own eye, when all the time there is a plank in your own? Hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. I want to point out two things here. First of all, if you're judging your brother or your sister from a worldly perspective or out of hurt and offence, you have no business pointing out their faults. No business whatsoever to be doing that. Because it's not coming from the right perspective. You're not seeing rightly. And secondly, the truth without love can be a blunt instrument. It can be used to great damage for others. So before we go bashing somebody with the truth, remember how closely Jesus identifies with that person. Remember, Jesus takes it personally. So we, before we speak to a brother or a sister, let's take a good look in the mirror first. Let's take a really good look in the mirror first and check our own heart and our own motives before we do this. Let's do business with God first and let's change the way that we see. And if you can't see your reflection in the mirror because there's a piece of wood in the way, maybe you should be asking somebody to, uh, you know, do I have something in my eye? Do I need to check my own heart first? Am I seeing rightly? Or have I got a plank in my life? Okay? Before we strain the speck out of somebody else's. When we speak the truth in genuine love, it's always for the other person's good. Always. Always. 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 to 8. You all know it, so I'm going to read it. Love is patient. Love is kind. It doesn't envy. It does not boast. And it is not proud. It doesn't dishonor others and it's not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. And it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects it always trusts, it always hopes, it always perseveres. Love never fails. It never fails. If we want to see love lift other people up, 
Now we must choose love. Because it's not going to fail. Love will never fail. You will never go wrong if you stick to love and loving others. Even in the hardest of cases, keep persisting in love. If you want to see love lift up others, then we need to change the way we see. We need to speak the truth in love. And then we need to lift others. Ecclesiastes 4, verse 9 and 10. This is from the Aramaic version of the Bible. That's the language Jesus spoke. This is what it says. It says, two are better than one, for they have a good reward in their labor. For if one falls, his companion lifts him up. But grieve for him who is alone. For if he falls, there is no one to lift him up. See, the church is a family that has been called to lift one another up when we fall down. That's what we're here to do. Sometimes we don't have the strength to pull ourselves up. I have had lots of seasons in my life where I was just so broken, I needed my brothers and sisters to lift me up because I didn't have the strength to do it for myself. And I'm so glad they did. I'm so glad they were praying for me. I'm so glad that people came alongside of me and helped me in those times because I needed it. And that's why God has placed us here. That's why he's placed us in this church. To love one another and lift one another up. Not pull one another down. Now the writer says, grieve for those who are alone. We don't know what's going on in a person's life all the time. We don't know the things that are in their background, the stuff which has caused them to slip up, to trip up, or to fall down. We just don't know. But we all know throughout this COVID season what it's like to be in isolation, don't we? We've all done it. We've all been in this place of isolation and we know that it's a dark place. It's not a good place to be in, in this place of isolation. Darkness, contrary to the popular song, is not your friend. It's not your friend. Instead, if you know somebody in the darkness of isolation, reach out to them. Reach out to them in love and lift them up. 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 11 says, Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up. Build one another up. Again, there's that, there's that thing. We're actually working towards something here. We're working towards the strengthening of the whole body of Christ as we come together in unity, building one another up in our faith, building one another up in love, encouraging one another. These are all things which are, are all positives which Christ brings us to. But you know what? We can only do it if we change our thinking, change the way that we see if we begin to actually walk in truth and love, then we can lift one another up. You know, it's easy. The easiest thing to do is actually to be encouraging because we all like that because it's feel good, right? <laughs> we all like to be encouraged and we can all encourage one another. So let's encourage one another. Use every gift that God has given you to build one another up in love. And that's going to look different for, for, for everybody. Some people, you know, that building somebody else up might be practical. It may be physical. It may be building a stud wall <laughs> for somebody, right? That's, that's encouraging for somebody, okay? It might be doing something like that. It, it might be offering to take somebody out. It might be simply putting your arm around them and giving them a hug. Right? But remind them, encourage them who they are in Christ Jesus. Because sometimes we forget. Sometimes we forget. Just life happens. And we forget who we are in Christ. And we need one another to come around us and remind us to look up. Lift your vision higher. Let me take you by the hand and pull you up. Lift you up. 
And one of the best places to do that is in a discipleship triad. Because that's where you do life with a small group of people that you can invest in and they can invest in you. It's where you share your life. It's where primary pastoral care happens within a small group environment. So I'd encourage you, join a discipleship triad if you haven't already. Because this is where we begin to know people's lives in a much more intimate way and we're able to encourage them on a regular basis because we can't always get to everybody but we can commit to a triad and to meet with those people on a regular basis. See, love, lift. If you want to see love lift people up to where they belong in Christ then we need to change the way that we see them. Not according to their faults or their failings, but as they truly are in Christ. We need to speak the truth in love. We need to lift them up, encourage them, remind them who they are in Christ. Because at the end of the day, we are at our best when we are participating in a loving community. We just are. So let's together, let's see love lift each other up. Amen. Amen. Yeah.